You are listening to the Lawyer Stories Podcast with host Benny Gold. Lawyer Stories was founded in July 2017 and is an expanding global network of lawyers and law students sharing their personal journeys to the noble profession of the practice of law. Join us on this podcast as we dig deeper into these stories and hear from lawyers and law students from around the world in all areas of the legal profession. Here at Lawyer Stories, we believe that every lawyer has a story. What's yours? Welcome to the Lawyer Stories podcast with Benny Gold. Uh, Today we are speaking with a legal icon uh, who has transcended generations with her fearless and tireless advocacy for women's rights and equality. Gloria Allred is the founding partner of Allred, Morocco, and Goldberg in Los Angeles, California. How are you? Just wonderful. Thanks for inviting me, Ben. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for being here. I just want to point out my red watch that I'm wearing tonight um, in your honor. Um, Thank you. Yes, of course. So, you know, you certainly have an amazing story. Um, And before, you know, before we get into it, I just wanted to let you know that I saw seeing All Red on on Netflix with my wife, who's actually a Penn alum, just like yourself. Um, And, you know, we thoroughly enjoyed it. What a life. Um, Just amazing, amazing stuff. And we also as you know, had Lisa, your daughter, um, mm-hmm. on the show like about a month or two ago. And, uh, it was, it was amazing. Like I loved connecting with her. She's, she's terrific. Um, and you must be like, so proud, right? Like I am so proud. And, um, not only as an attorney, but as a mom, cause terrific, terrific. So, thank you. um, so tell, so first I just want to lawyer stories. We just, we talk about the story, the path, why somebody went into the professional law. And then we're going to discuss like what, obviously what you're, uh, what you're up to now, but, and a lot of the cases that, that you've had, but so tell us about your, your humble beginnings there in, in Philadelphia. Well, I was born in Philadelphia and my parents, uh, Morris and Stella, uh, were wonderful parents and I was very fortunate and blessed to have them. And we lived in a little row house in Philadelphia. My father was a door-to-door salesperson. Uh, My mom was a full-time homemaker and went to public schools and ultimately to Philadelphia High School for Girls and uh, then uh, to the University of Pennsylvania. I was graduated from Penn. Uh, Became uh, an assistant buyer in a department store uh, in at Gimbal, Gimbal Brothers Department Store in Philadelphia, and then ultimately became a teacher in uh, the at Benjamin Franklin High School. Also, I was a substitute teacher elsewhere, and um, then ultimately I decided I wanted to move to California. Um, I had uh, been married and then divorced when I was in college, yeah. gave birth to my daughter, um, and. Uh, then decided as a single parent that I wanted to move to California and teach in Watts, uh, which I did. It was one year after the Watts rebellion or riot, depending on your point of view. Okay. White flight of the teachers out of the schools. And I decided to move there to California. And uh, then I uh, left teaching for a year. I became the first female staff person for the Teachers Association, which later after I left became the United Teachers Los Angeles Teachers Union um, and uh, ultimately went to law school. And there I met my partners, Michael Morocco, Nathan Goldberg, and I've been with them as my partners for 47 years. Amazing, yeah. Have uh, other partners and associates as well. And uh, we're the I think the longest uh, and most success, longest uh, existing and most successful women's rights private law firm in the United States. Uh, so we're just very fortunate to be able to do what we do and do it successfully and win hundreds of millions of dollars for victims. Yeah, that's a am- that's that's an amazing uh, snapshot. And obviously, you know, the work you do is uh, amazing on behalf of people who really um, don't have that voice for themselves. Like, so backing up uh, sort of a far way to law school, like 
I think you went to law school and it was like a 93% male ratio. That's correct. correct. Like, so like, what was that experience like for you? Well, uh, I was called on quite a bit. You were, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I said to one of my professors one time, I know my name, the end of my name starts with A because I had been married and changed my name to Allred. Right. And, but still, when you call on me, I, I generally do know the answers. Uh, we have several hundred people in this class. Yeah. Um, have you considered calling on someone else instead of calling <laughs> on me every time yeah. and a few other people? And he said, well, I don't think you're tough enough. Okay. So that's why I call on you. Well, at graduation and then after graduation, actually, I saw him after I started practicing law. And I said, Professor, do you think I'm tough enough now? And he said, oh, yes, you're, you're more than tough enough. <laughs> so it was very funny. That is funny. Um, mm -hmm. So to sort of jump right into, um, you, you went on a trip um, at age 25. You were on a vacation in Acapulco. You had a situation that happened. I know it's public. I don't, you know, you can say what you want or what you don't you know, one on, on our episode about it. Um, but I just want to know, like, did that, so that changed your life in terms of like your trajectory of like where you're going to take your career, would you say that whole, the whole um, vacation and everything that happened there in Acapulco? Well, I mean, I, I'm a believer that often the experiences that we have, positive and negative, are for a purpose. Yeah. And often when it happens to us, we don't know what that purpose is. But for me, as a young woman in going to Mexico on a vacation, as many young people did sure. and still do. Sure. Uh, and ending up being raped at gunpoint and then getting pregnant then in California, trying to get an abortion when it was a crime for a doctor to provide it, although not for a woman to have it, uh, made me more sensitive to the fact that abortion should be safe and legal, not yeah. uh, unsafe and illegal, because, you know, I almost died from an illegal abortion because I was hemorrhaging, Right, had to be taken to a hospital. They saved my life, but the point was they wouldn't take us if, to have an abortion, had to have a back alley abortion. The hospital only would take us if we were essentially bleeding to death. And so that is one of the reasons for my strong commitment to making sure that abortion today is safe, legal, affordable, and available, and it's very yeah. much under attack. And it also helps to explain my commitment to victims of rape, sexual assault, sexual harassment, child sexual abuse, um, because I have an understanding for, you know, what many victims suffer, having suffered myself. So perhaps the purpose was for me to understand that none of us are spared. We all have many challenges, legal health challenges, yeah, economic, and we just have to try to make the best of it and learn from it and see if we can help others as a result of it. For sure. So did you have a moment in your life where you said, I'm going to be a lawyer? Like, what was that moment like? Do you remember? Well, <laughs> I remember going to the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Okay. Standing at the counter, asking for an application that was long before internet even long before cell phones sure <clears throat> and asking for an application after i had been graduated with honors in english from the university of pennsylvania undergrad mm -hmm. and then when i looked at the application i just stood there and said to myself what am i doing this is ridiculous why would i apply i won't be able to support myself and my child right. i won't be able to pay the tuition at that point, I didn't think I would get a scholarship. And even if I did, I didn't think I could afford it. So even though I wanted to become a lawyer at that point, 
it wasn't meant to be. And that's fine because as it turns out, when I went to law school much later, years later to Loyola, that's where right. I met my wonderful partners. Right. They were still with me 47 years later as my, well, they're like my brothers and they're my, they're wonderful partners. And, and by the way, like lawyers, they, look, terrific they seem lawyers. like, they seem like great guys, like based on the, they are. on the net, on the, uh, yeah. Being all right, I turned to Karen and I'm like, these these guys seem great. Like they seem like really like mensches, you know, like really nice guys. They are complete mensches. Yeah. And they are hilarious and yeah. really bright lawyers. Nathan, my partner Nathan Goldberg, was number one in our class at graduation wow. from Loyola Law School out of three hundred and some students. And Michael was, I think, number four uh, out of those, you know, more than three hundred graduates. And they are funny and they are resilient and yeah. they have confidence in me and my right. decisions and that's incredible that they would and did and they've always supported me and we laugh and we argue and then you know i have a sign on my desk that says be reasonable do it my way do it so, okay i like that i'll have to look for that, that kind of sums up our our relationship but yep. no if they have good arguments to give me as to why we should or should not do something, <laughs> I will listen and I can be persuaded. Okay, good. So I, my question, my next question is like, what was the case or like moment where you were like, okay, I, you realize you've, you've sort of made it and like, you're going to be in the public eye. Like, what was the case? Was there a moment where you're like, wow, okay, the, the media is following me. I'm going to be in the public eye. I'm representing women's rights, because I think there weren't a lot of women's rights attorneys when you sort of entered that field, maybe? No, actually, no, there weren't. <laughs> right, okay. So I was filling a vacuum. Okay, okay. So you, you were like, this is sort of what I'm gonna, I need to learn all the women's right, like everything, and I'm gonna, this is the path I'm gonna take. Well, I was asked to become president of the National Organization for Women in Los Angeles. And essentially it was nobody else wanted it. And they, so they said, will you do it? <laughs> and I said, okay, but only if everybody wants me to do it. Because it was really only a small group that, in those days. So I did, I became president. And then my first press conference was about the governor, Governor Brown not appointing as many women judges as we believed he had promised to do if he was elected. So my first press conference was criticizing him for not appointing enough women judges. And that's how we got started. And then he did appoint some more after my press conference. <laughs> okay. And so then, you know, the group who asked me to do it said, we'll do it again because we need more women judges. I did it again. He appointed more. And ultimately I saw him one day and he said, Gloria, why do you always criticize me for not appointing enough women judges? And then he named like four or five that he had appointed. And I said, Governor, you can't name all of the male judges you've been appointed. When you can't name all of the women judges you've appointed, that's when you will have appointed enough. And that's when I will stop criticizing you. Yeah. There you go. Okay, fair enough. Um, so, so what advice would you have for somebody uh, who wants to be a civil rights lawyer and wants to fight for the underdog? How can they get there? Well, first of all, if you want to be a civil rights lawyer, you have to do one of maybe three things. One okay. is you should form your own firm. Okay. Two, you could join another firm. It's a civil rights firm. Um, Three, you could maybe work for the government as well, uh, or nonprofits okay. uh, that advocate civil right for civil rights. Those are your options. Okay, there you go. So a couple of your cases I just want to touch on. You know, we don't have to go super deep, but um, so tell us about suing uh, the Savon drug, like. I remember save on drugs. Save on drugs. I remember going to like Toys R Us and Child World. I don't mean to call anybody out, like, but when I was a kid and like there were like the the aisles. How did you find your plaintiffs for that? I'm curious. And 
And like how like what what was that like that that whole lawsuit? Oh, that was like decades ago. Decades ago, seventy nine. Yeah, and uh, that's a long time ago, <laughs> but uh, forty two years ago. It's crazy. So anyway, uh, well, that was a drugstore that sold had in their toy aisles boys toys and girls toys they had signs yep. and under the boys toys they would have things like the money games doctor kits okay firefighter outfits girls toys would be cook cookware yeah you know baby dolls you know and and that kind of thing and so you know we represented seven little boys and girls right and the so the boys would say why why can't can't we be chefs? And if we get married, don't we have to cook food sometime for our family? And so why is all the cookware on the girl side? And then the girls would say, why is all, why are all the money games on the boys side? Don't we need to be able to budget money like for our family when we go to the store? Right. And so forth. So anyway, we sued. And we were successful with that lawsuit. It's amazing. It's interesting because I just saw there was, I think, some legislation passed in California just yeah. this year or last year about boys' toys versus girls' toys. There it yes, is. Yeah. Uh, the legislature finally caught up after 42 years. 42 years. Now they have gender neutral aisles. I saw that on the Yeah, there's no today, institutional but... memory here right. of the fact and I think that, we targeted... did that case. Well, actually, we did that case years ago, and under the California law, under civil rights, which it could still be used for this purpose. But so I'm glad that if the legislature wants to make a statement. That's fine with me. <laughs> so yeah, and I think Target just has like kids aisles now, like from what I researched. Yeah, right. So anyway, well done. Um, Thank so you. We've had a lot of significant cases since Signi then, too. Let me just tell you, so many cases, like, I don't know which one to ask you about. But so I, many cases. So, so many cases. Time. I picked out, like, a few because I know our time is very limited. So let's jump on to the one that we all read in law school, and that is very significant, a landmark 1973 ruling of Roe versus Wade. Um, legalizing that's abortion. Not my, that's not my case, but it's an important case. It's not your case, but actually, I have a question about that, right? Because... There are signs. There, there's that sign of you that with with um, with the plaintiff Jane Roe Norma McCovey holding the sign right back in the day that says "Keep abortion legal." Like that photo's on the internet. And then 20 years later, you represented her. You wanted to, you were guiding her through the pro-choice movement. So, did you know her? I'm just like I'm just trying to reconcile like what I saw because I couldn't really figure it out on my own. The um, answer is it's very simple. Okay. I was at a pro-choice rally. And she came up to say hello to me. I asked her if she was speaking at the rally. Yeah. And she said, no, I'm not. I said, you're not? Why not? She said, well, they didn't want me to speak. I said, well, I don't really understand that. You're the Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade. Right. That's crazy. Why would like, they want you to speak? She said they never let me speak or something like that. So anyway, we ended up talking. And after that, I ended up helping her to have her voice heard, which I thought was important. It's amazing. And I think it's so important because, you know, we all are required to read these things in law school. And by the way, I went to law school like a while ago. Like I'm not a fresh at a school law school, not that it matters, but I think it's kind of interesting to learn about the like what happens like surrounding those cases. Like I spoke to Lisa about Bowers v. Hardwick. She said she had a little baby like step like when she was in law school, like sort of picketing. And I but I just think it's super interesting because those are cases that we all read about. So, you know, whether or not you're her attorney or you're 20 years later, you're guiding her through. Um, I, I think that's that's really interesting um, commentary that she came up to you during that case, mm -hmm. and and for well, you or, of course, or, with or, the story, right, like, or after it, yeah, or, or after right. after the case. But but I think also with your lawyer story, like uh, you know, as we call it here, like that connects back to sort of like this, like what you you've dealt with, and I think that's really important, you know. So well, also because I also believe in a voice for women. Sure. That if they, you know. Prior to my going into 
practice, often you would see male lawyers, sometimes with their clients, but their clients wouldn't be allowed to speak. And I was committed to making sure my clients could speak. But we've had so many important landmark cases, published cases. So many. Wins in the, where we've won in the United States Court of Appeals, where we've won in the California Supreme Court, where we've won in the California Court of Appeals, where we won uh, at the end of 2019, we won, my partners won a trial, the largest verdict that year for one victim of sexual harassment in California, yep. $58,250,000 for one victim of sexual harassment. Wow. And a few months before that, another verdict for another victim of that same perpetrator, that same billionaire, Alki David, a verdict of more than $5 million. Uh, wow. So, uh, yeah. you know, but so that's, you know, that was one of the largest ever in the country for one victim of sexual harassment as well, in excess of 58 million. So that's a, you know, that's so important. Then we had a case, we had cases uh, last year, we represented 72 victims of George Tyndall, Dr. Tyndall at USC. Yep. And, you know, there was a multi-million dollar settlement. Yep. And we, we won in excess of, I forget exactly how much, but it was in excess of 72 million Ooh. for our clients. And this is, you know, we're moving forward. We're not moving backwards. Sure. Uh, and, you know, we have a lot of cases that we are working on and we're so proud of our clients. Yeah. The credit goes to them for their courage. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I actually just want to ask you about one of your former cases too, and then we'll move on. But so, because I think it's interesting with, with um, OJ Simpson, right? So like he had the dream team and obviously we know the prosecutor, you know, represents the state or the government, but you represented Nicole Brown, right? Her family, her family rather family, than the state. Yeah, right. So, deceased, so yeah. was that like a new, was that a new sort of thing where like somebody would come forward and represent the family of a deceased or is that because i think it's super important that like everybody be represented right so okay well here's the answer that uh, victims in a criminal case are entitled to have their own attorney as right. we know the prosecutor the district attorney does not represent victims right they represent in this case the state of california yeah, sure. whose law was violated most victims think, oh, the prosecutor represents us. Not true. And the prosecutor represents the state. Uh, and uh, so victims are entitled to their own attorney, private attorney. And victims then have confidentiality with their private attorney, which they don't have as a matter of law with the prosecutor. And that's very important. So uh, I was contacted by the Brown family and uh they asked me to represent them and that's why i did that's amazing okay um so so i know so many cases so little time we don't have a lot of time but who's your role model like was there anybody that was actually your remote your role model and that just curious uh as an attorney not really okay so okay go ahead i'm sorry no, that's okay. But early on in my career, I met a woman who wrote shoulder to shoulder and which was the story of the suffragists fighting for their right, the right to vote in England. And she said to me, Gloria, you need to help women have a voice. Because then when people hear about the injustices against them, then that's when there'll be a momentum you know, to right the wrongs and to want to help them to win justice. So that was part of the inspiration for my doing what I did. So what did Ruth Bader Ginsburg mean to you? Okay, Ruth, who is here with me today. Yeah. Here she is, RBG. Oh, I love that. Notorious RBG. Notorious, yeah, I have a t-shirt. Here's the more sedate rbg 
Beautiful. Yeah. But if you look at my homepage, you will yep. see that um, there's a photo of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and me at the talking with each other at the U.S. Supreme Court in the courtroom, and then yep. also having dinner together in the Supreme Court dining room. And I was just so honored and blessed to have the time that I had with her. Um, she came up to me in the courtroom when I was sitting there waiting for a ceremony to start honoring a federal judge to which I was invited. And I was looking down and all of a sudden I look up and there she was standing beside <laughs> me. So I jumped up and she started talking with me. And then also when we went into the dinner later that honored the federal judge, the host of the dinner surprised me and sat me next to her for dinner. So we had a wonderful conversation at dinner. And all I can tell you is she was just as passionate about women's rights as everyone thinks that she yeah, yeah. is and was, and more yeah. so very candid with me about her opinions about things. Really? I mean, well, she didn't ask me to keep her confidence, but I always feel that yeah. it is appropriate to keep her confidence. Yes. Uh, but she certainly made me laugh, but she was so candid. And, uh, and I just loved her even more. And it's just a blessing to me that I had the opportunity to have a conversation with her. And she was very interested in women's rights cases that we have done and still were doing at yeah. the time I that, spoke to her. You know, that's so amazing. And somebody like me sort of like sitting back, like I kind of see, I don't know if this is a compliment, but I, I sort of see like both of you as like, you know, the women's rights pioneers and like mm -hmm. do you do you sort of feel like a heightened sense of responsibility to carry on like her her legacy in a way I mean because that's sort of what you do you know like you well she did have a different role I mean as a member of the court sure sure and as an advocate before the court before she became a justice she had to be more let's put it measured <laughs> which sometimes right. she was and sometimes she wasn't depending right. on what she believed was appropriate. And, um, and I think towards the end, all bets were off. She wanted to say what she <laughs> wanted to say and she said it, which I love. Yeah. Um, but for me, I'm, you know, I'm an advocate, strong advocate. Um, I'm a hellraiser. Yeah. Um, and um, <laughs> so, that people know that and and but also you know i know it's appropriate when when we're litigating cases when we're trying cases when we're in the court of public opinion when we're in the court of law and i do feel a responsibility we are the leading women's rights law firm in the united states yeah if not frankly if not the world i say oh, that yeah. because yeah. i get <laughs> so many i get contacted by you know clients in in france and spain and the uk and south america Pro -hoc Vice. Pro -hoc Eastern Vice. Europe. Yeah. no these are people who have been hurt in the united states but okay. they're now back living in another country amazing uh or they were hurt in another country by a citizen of the united states anyway i get a lot of people contacting me i get people contacting me saying can you speak to us over here i was honored, I was just honored by a law society in England, okay, excuse me, in Ireland, that the law students wanted to hear what I had oh, to yeah. say. And they gave me a prestigious award from their from their university. And, you know, there is a thirst for knowledge about how can how can women become empowered? How can yeah. they seek justice? How can they fight the rich, the powerful, the famous yeah. government, large businesses, others who deny them their rights. And what How do you think? What, happen? what What do you tell? I mean, I know it's a whole, it's like a whole program, but like, can you, can you like, sum it up a little bit? Like how, that was one of my questions. Like how can people, how can women become empowered and have a voice for themselves? Well, first of all, we want them to have a voice, but we also want them to have rights. It's not just about sure. speaking. It's about winning rights. And as I always say, nobody ever gave women any rights, including up to today. Nobody right. gives women any rights. We always have to fight to win them. And it's always a battle. Yeah. Uh, 
because the status quo is very strong and those in power don't want to give it up. So we have to fight and take it. Uh, we have to win it. Earning it is not enough because there are a lot of women well qualified for opportunities. So the fact they've earned that it means nothing in the sense that they are denied often opportunities, yeah. employment that they should be able to have, promotions. So, you know, I, I, I let women know different options that they can pursue to win their rights. But of course, they have to want to do it. And there are risks in seeking justice, but there are also many risks in not seeking justice. So that's true. That's true. Have to weigh the cost and the benefits. Uh, and make a decision about what makes sense for that particular person. So I have a question. So is it surprising to you, like, um, like what are your th thoughts um, when, a, as a society, we found we find out that someone who's been like an American sweetheart for all these years, mm -hmm. and somebody who's been um, just like so loved by by uh, society has engaged in all of these sexual assaults and, and rapes like allegedly allegedly like maybe bill cosby um like what like what is um is that is does that surprise you anymore when you see that no <laughs> no and there are many uh you know persons who are accusers of bill cosby in my documentary on netflix called seeing all red right and now there's a documentary coming out uh on showtime soon okay uh, i think i have uh, some brief comments that they they are going to be broadcasting in that as well uh in yeah. reference to bill cosby but no does it surprise me no because you know we have a lot of people think that somebody they see on television as a character in a sitcom or a drama is yeah. that person well that person is playing a role right and in in real life he may be someone completely different. So that's what we've learned. I've represented, you know, victims, of, and I still do a Bill Cosby. We have a trial coming up in April, civil trial uh, uh, in Santa Monica against yeah, Bill Cosby. Sure. And I've represented, you know, victims of R. Kelly uh, yep. and Harvey Weinstein. Yep. And that LA trial is coming up, criminal trial in later this year. And my client was the key prosecution witness in the criminal trial in New York, for which he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Yep. Um, and, you know, so on and on, I have a client who is going to be a witness in the Cuba Gooding, Cuba Gooding Jr. Uh, case right. in New York. So, yes, it, it doesn't end. I represented 20 victims of Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, so... I mean, yeah. I feel very fortunate we've earned the trust of so many women oh, yeah, con totally. people contacting us if they are in trouble and they know they can speak to me confidentially and oh my goodness, find out yes. what they can do. Yeah, I mean, you're Gloria Allred. Come on, like, of course they can call you. Um, so my wife is like a huge Sex and the City fan, and she actually worked at Safe Horizon in New York City for a while. I don't know if you've heard of it. Giving it a, I'm very familiar with Safe Horizon. Yeah, she worked there for a while, um, and now she does something different, but just giving them a shout out too. Um, Good. So she's a big Sex and the City fan, and mm -hmm. so all these people came forth now with the reboot of the show uh, on Chris, Chris Noth, and you know, we've recognized that you represent a few of them. So what, like, just for my knowledge and whoever else, like, why do you think it takes a while for women to come forward like if they've dealt with these things say like 20 years ago or in the past in the past what is like why does it take so long well there's a power differential sure and the person in power in this case mr noth um was a very successful actor yep and uh my client Lisa Gentilly alleges that, you know, she was threatened that if she told anyone, she wouldn't sing again or she wouldn't be, she is a singer songwriter, was at the time, and was afraid that 
you know, she might be retaliated against if in fact she did tell anyone. So that's what she alleges happened. So fear, Ben, is the number one weapon that is used yeah. to silence women. And uh, fear, of course, is a benefit to predators and uh, is very useful to them as a weapon. Once women break out of that fear, many things are possible for them. But there are risks uh, in speaking out and there are risks in not speaking out. There are risks in filing lawsuits. There are risks in not filing a lawsuit. Right. So all of these things have to be weighed when a woman decides if she's coming forward. And, you know, that's one of the reasons that I'm supporting the Adult Survivors Act in New York to yep. change the law so that women who did not assert their rights within the time frame set by law, statute of limitations, will have an opportunity to have access to justice rather than have the courthouse door slammed in their face. Yeah. So you can tell your wife that uh, she can expect to see me working with Safe Horizons. Nice. They've been a leader in getting, you know, in advocating for that bill. They certainly worked for 13 years to win the passage of the Child Victims Act in New York. And I have an office in New York as well as Los Angeles. So we want to see it passed. Good. Very good. So in the Netflix documentary, Seeing All Red, like one thing that I was like, I mean, I was impressed by all of it, but well, there was there was a moment um, when I'm not even going to say a gentleman, but a man like got in your face. And, you know, I think this is sort of, um, I think there's a piece that probably a lot of people remember, like a man got in your face um, and told you, you're going to be happy, you're going to be unhappy for the next four years. I think it was at the Lincoln Memorial during the Trump, I think, was it the Trump inauguration? And um, spoiler alert, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So my question is sort of, it's aside from that, but I was so impressed. And so how do you deal with that? Because you literally looked the guy, the guy was like, like inches okay. from your face. Right. He was. And he was like wearing sunglasses and he was just like, you're going to not be happy for the next four years. And you thanked him. He actually was wearing a MAGA hat. A MAGA hat. You, you thanked him. Trump for for asserting his first amendment rights and i don't know if it was the cameras gloria i don't know but you you were so cool like under pressure so tell us well, we and had you, no you know, idea that we had no idea that moment was going to happen fine but okay so and you know you're also seeing all red starts out with a moment where you're challenging people in a tv show right like you're saying you know, you're, you're talking for women's rights, like back in the day, like, I think it would really help a lot of people if you gave us advice on how to really deal with the adversary when they're coming at you in the moment, like, how do you stay so cool, calm and collective? Well, you know, I, I respect my adversaries. That's good. And, uh, I think that we need to do more listening to people and who have different points of view and let them know that they have been heard, that we differ from them, but we still respect their right to, you know, speak about what they believe. And just because they're heated yeah, and feeling as though they want to start perhaps a fight and it's a big moment for them you know yeah maybe right? yeah maybe maybe they want to start it just orally maybe they want to have a physical fight i don't know but you know i i just think that it's important for people to be treated as human beings they have feelings they want to be acknowledged so I want to be heard. So that's how I that's how I approach it. I don't approach it like, oh my God, I'm threatened. Oh my God, what? Well, you I don't you do? don't take it's it personally, not, right? You don't take it well. Personally. I mean, you know, you take it, it is deep personal, breath, but like, it's not personal. But you know, I I try to understand them. Yeah, 
Okay. And just not think of them, oh, the enemy, as though they're the enemy, as though, you know, I don't have to cower in front of them. On the other hand, I don't have to, if they want to fight, doesn't mean that I have to agree that I'm going to engage in a fight. So I just try to be calm because when you're calm, you're able to make better decisions. There you go. Okay. Then if your emotions are taking control, you're out of balance. Right. When you're out of balance, it's hard to make the right decisions. Right. And so it's better just to be calm. After all, I'm only, I'm only about five foot two or one, <laughs> five foot one and a half, as some people say. So I, I, I need to use my head because that's what I'm going to need to use. It's incredible. You know? I mean, I, I think, you know, I'd get called on in law school and I was just like, you know, and you, you know, you get challenged all the time by people who want to tell you you have an unpopular opinion, which I don't think you do by any means. And well, sometimes it is not popular to think that women and, have equal but you know how to men. handle it. Like you sort of smile and just sort of take it. I mean, yeah, it's a real yeah. skill. It's a real skill. Well, I used to teach in Philadelphia at this all boys school in a high risk neighborhood, you know, disadvantaged students. And the kids were like, a lot of them were six feet tall, you know, six foot three. And sure. here I was just a shrimp boat of it. And it was all boy. And I was one of the few female teachers in the school. And it was like 3,000 young men in the recreation room at a high rise school and me on guard. Like, yeah. so I had a like, I often was the one who went in to break up fights and things. So okay. sending Gloria, you know. I, sending Gloria. I, I love it. Sending Gloria. I, love I, it. I I don't know. I generally things have worked out. Okay, so far so good. Well, you're terrific. So we see many of your cases um, on TV and media, but like, tell us about the pro bono. I know you're doing like a lot of pro bono work and you're doing stuff like behind the media. Like, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the answer is yes and no, because, okay. you know, as a lawyer, my financial arrangement or lack of it with my clients, I think is confidential attorney client privilege sure. communication. Sure. However, if a client wants to say she's doing this for me pro bono, meaning for the public good, yep. at no charge, that's up to them. But I don't feel that I am the one who should disclose that. <clears throat> okay, got it. So but I will say from the beginning, my partners and I, Nathan and Michael, decided yep. that we are going to do pro bono cases from the beginning. Not all, because we have we're a business. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But um, we're going to do them as a regular part of our practice. We're going to do it when we can't afford to do it, as well as when we can afford to do it. It's just going to be part of who we are. And that's right. what we've done. Got it. So how have you seen the profession change through your years as an attorney? Well, more women lawyers, which is good. Great. More women judges, not enough. More women in elected office, good, not enough. Uh, and so we still have a long way to go. Okay. It's like when, you know, someone asked Ruth Bader Ginsburg, how many women should be in the United States Supreme Court? And she said nine. Is it nine women? Is nobody. Nine women, yeah. Them. When there are nine men on the United States Supreme Court, why would it be shocking to say nine women? Right. So that's how I feel. <clears throat> but there are not enough women partners in law firms. Okay. I'm very fortunate that I am a par founding partner in my law firm and we have other women partners as well now, but um, there need to be more because that's where, you know, decisions are made about which cases will be taken. Got it. So like as in a society, like how can we help you? Like how can we do better? For like for what you're, stri you know, striving to achieve women's rights, equal rights, civil rights. Well, I would say two things. One, we need the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment to the United States Constitution, that equal rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. And that was first introduced in 1923. Okay. So next year, it'll be 100 years, and we still have not one passage of the ERA. 
took okay. 72 years to win the right to vote. Right. Now it'll be 99 years since the ERA was introduced. So that's important. Everybody should get behind that. And secondly, we need more women's rights lawyers and law firms like mine. There are not enough. There are victims' rights law firms. There are not enough women's rights law firms. Okay. Uh, and so I think that's important as well. I mean, I used to be before COVID, I was on a plane every week going to a, a different state. Uh, I mean, I'm licensed in California, New York, and Washington, D.C., okay. but co-counseling in other states and being admitted, for example, or seeking to be admitted in many states, like I have a, um, I have a, my, a pro hoc, it's called, to seeking yep. to be admitted now in North Carolina, <clears throat> in a big case where I'm co-counseling with North Carolina attorneys. Uh, we have 50, 60 clients alleging uh, that they are victims of child sexual abuse when they when they uh, attended the University of North Carolina School of the Arts some decades ago. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, now the COVID, you know, traveling is restricted, but with Zoom, I'm still co-counseling <laughs> with attorneys in many other states. So we have a huge practice in terms of you know, being active in many states. And it, it's just wonderful work. It's exciting work. Uh, and we love, we love helping to win a successful result for our clients because it's, you know, the, and seeing them transform from coming in as victims to the next stage, becoming survivors to the, the last stage, I call it becoming fighters for change. That's As great. You can see them doing in my Netflix documentary. So yeah, it's but you know winning them compensation so that they can start a new chapter in their lives, and be, and and just to see how they blossom and become the people they were always meant to be. Yeah, and then that has a ripple effect on their families, their children, their coworkers, their community. It's it's just wonderful to see them become the empowered women they've always wanted to be and were meant to be. I love that. Um, do you think like you're, and do you think all of this happens, like what we've spoken to about without your, your trip um, back to Mexico in the day? Like, do you think like this is- I don't know, I don't know. I'm a product of all my life experience. We all yeah. are. I'm yeah. also a product of my experiences just growing up as a woman in the United States. Yeah. And, you know, the good, bad and the ugly. And so a single mom. Cool. Yeah, a single mom. Like... All of it. All of it. And uh, so I don't know. I, I just could never have contemplated when I was, you know, a little girl in Philadelphia that I would have the life I, I lead today and would be able to help so many people. And, and of course, I always want them to pass it on to people, you know, my clients and often they do. You know, they inspire yeah. others. They inspire others with their courage. So it's it's just great. I you know it's it's wonderful. Women deserve so much more, but again, we have to fight to win it. Yeah, I mean, like, how do you have like so much uh, courage and inspiration? Like, what do you think it de like derives from? Like, what do you like read something to yourself? Do you like what's your? It derives from knowing what the alternative is. The alternative yeah. doing nothing. It's unacceptable. Yeah. yeah. So I have a passion for justice. I know my duty. It's a duty. It's not just a choice. There, you know, I was privileged to be able to go to law school. And now I have to pass it on. Yeah. That's that's what it's all about. So what legacy? Then like like let's leave in the legacy. What legacy are you leaving like when you retire? I don't know if you'll ever retire, but I'm like, not going what? anywhere. I <laughs> know I Nobody I know thinks I'll ever retire. Nobody no, you I know won't. thinks that thinks that I'll even take a weekend <laughs> off. Nobody I know thinks that I'll take a day off. Okay. Well, bad bad question then, all right. <laughs> but okay, that's that's terrific. Um, do you have any other general advice to the lawyer stores community about like any anything that you, you would like to say? That um, I know we covered a lot. We tried to cover a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't cover your career in and your life 
you know, in, in uh, you know, one sitting, but surely terrific. Um, well, I would say if you see something that you think is an injustice, help the victim of injustice to do something about it, if it's possible to do something about it. Yeah. And, you know, seek the advice of people who would know what can be done and then see if you can help that person to do it if that's what they want. Okay. So if you are educated about your rights, you can learn about your rights. And then you have an opportunity to, you know, to right the wrong and to make the wrongdoer pay the consequences of the wrong. Ask yourself, is this the time that I should do it? Maybe it is. Yeah. Okay, and then because when you when you make the wrongdoer pay for the cost of the wrong, you're also helping others because that may be a lesson to him. Don't do it again. Yeah, because it'll just be too costly to you. Not going to be worth it. So right. that's about that's it. You know, we say in the women's movement, become the person you want to marry in terms of the characteristics of that person. If you value someone who's going to protect you, learn how to protect yourself. If you want somebody with a sense of humor, learn how to have a sense of humor yourself. If you want to marry a lawyer, become a lawyer and, and all of that. So oh, that's interesting. I say, I if like you that. want to see, like if that. you want to, if you want to be a person who's fearless, become fearless. If you want to seek justice, become a person who seeks justice. You know, you can do it and you can do, even if you're not a lawyer, there's a lot you can do to make this world a better place. So yeah. with that, I think I'm going to have to go. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Legal icon, Gloria Allred, wherever you are in the world today, enjoy yourselves. <laughs>